It's Monday. It's the uh, 23rd of June. You're watching Arirang, Korea's only global network. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gun Young. Now, the Korean government has summoned Jap Japan's ambassador to Seoul in for a meeting this Monday afternoon to lodge a formal complaint over Tokyo's review of a landmark apology on wartime sexual enslavement. Our Hwang Ji-hye tells us what the Korean side had to say. With the relationship between Korea and Japan growing increasingly frosty over historical issues, Seoul summoned the Japanese ambassador on Monday. It came in response to Tokyo's announcement last week of its re-examination into the Kono statement. Cho Tae-yong, Korea's vice foreign minister, told the Japanese envoy Koro Pesho it's a historical fact that women were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II, and the whole world recognizes it. He added that the more the Abe administration attempts to dismiss the Kuno statement, the more its credibility and international reputation will suffer. The Abe government, while upholding the statement, claimed that Seoul was in close consultation with Japan when the statement was being drawn up. The Kuno statement was issued back in 1993 by then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kuno. It acknowledged for the first time the forced sexual enslavement of some 200,000 women. In addition to calling in Japanese Ambassador Koro Pesho to complain about the move out of Tokyo, the Korean government plans to register historical records regarding the so-called comfort women with UNESCO and bring up the issue during United Nations meetings. Korea's foreign ministry is known to have tentatively concluded that the Japanese review was trying to diminish the testimonies of sexual slavery victims and the apologetic tone of the Kuno statement. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Strategic patience, that's a key U.S. policy on North Korea. But while the U.S. patiently waits for the North to show its sincerity about denuclearizing, the regime is engaging in a diplomacy of its own, cozying up with Japan and Russia. Should Washington take a fresh approach on Pyongyang? Our Hwang sung hee posed that very question to Frank Genuzzi, who worked as Asia policy advisor for the Obama campaign in 2008 and is now serving as president of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. Well, the most important thing is that North Korea continues to develop their nuclear uh, capacity. And as long as the United States remains uh, sidelined, um, I see no likelihood that that's going to change. Maybe putting people uh, ahead of plutonium, uh, focusing on some of the people-to-people -people, uh, interactions, uh, which could address some of the pressing human rights concerns in North Korea, uh, but also perhaps uh, begin to create some uh, greater enthusiasm inside North Korea among the elite uh, for renegotiating uh, the terms of, uh, uh, of their current path uh, their, their current commitment to nuclear weapons. You just mentioned people over plutonium approach. What do you mean exactly by that? So I, I think the United States uh, and other parties to the six-party talks uh, need to focus on building a constituency inside North Korea for change. Uh, it means even if you keep sanctions, uh, doing things like family reunification visits, cultural exchanges, uh, bringing North Korean students out of North Korea. All of these things uh, can help show North Korea that the true path to security does not lie with nuclear weapons. Really knowing that there is this huge nuclear threat in North Korea and just using the people-to-people -people approach, wouldn't that be too dangerous? Well, the situation is dangerous now and nothing that the six parties are doing is making it any less dangerous. So, uh, admittedly, uh, a people-focused approach will not yield immediate results on the nuclear threat that we face, but neither is the current uh, strategic patience approach yielding anything in terms of a reduction of the threat. President Xi Jinping will be uh, coming to South Korea next month. Uh, traditionally, Chinese leaders have visited North Korea before coming to South Korea. President Xi isn't doing that. Is this another sign of change in uh, China-North Korea relations? Uh, it, it's a very important signal by China that China sees the long-term future of the Korean Peninsula uh, being decided more by Seoul 
than by Pyongyang. And China wants to have that discussion ultimately uh, with South Korea. Uh, so I think it's a very good sign uh, for China's recognition of the realities on the Korean Peninsula. Now, into a different story. A conscript soldier who killed five of his comrades this past weekend is now under military custody after pulling the gun on himself. His injuries are not reportedly to be uh, life threatening. The 22 year old had been holed up and surrounded by authorities for nearly two days now. Our Kim Ji Yun reports. The standoff between a fugitive soldier and authorities has come to an end after 43 hours with an attempted suicide. Authorities say the 22-year-old shot himself in the side with a K-2 rifle that he is conscious and are being transported to a nearby hospital for treatment. Authorities had been in contact throughout the morning and afternoon with the sergeant, who had earlier asked to speak with his father by phone. His father and elder brother had reportedly been trying to persuade the soldier to surrender peacefully. The series of events began Saturday night when the soldier, identified only by his surname Yim, killed five of his comrades and injured at least seven others in a grenade and gun attack. He later fled to an area some 10 kilometers from the military base where he opened fire on troops before being cornered. The motive for the initial shooting remains unknown, but army sources say Im's actions were likely premeditated and targeted specific individuals. Im was on the list of soldiers that needed special attention as he struggled adapting to military life. He had just three months left before he was scheduled to be discharged. The attack is the latest in a series of carried out by Korean soldiers. Eight were killed back in 2005 after a soldier went rogue at his military base. And a similar incident on Kanghua Island in 2011 left four dead. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Well, across the globe, Sunni militants have made some serious headways in Iraq, now capturing three border crossings on the western frontier. And the border crossings line up with Syria and Jordan, which puts the ISIL militants steps closer to taking over the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. Now, this is because they now have control of the Abu Kamal Qaim crossing, which also serves as a strategic supply route connecting to eastern Syria largely in the hands of ISIL and the militants who want to create an Islamic caliphate there. Now also insurgents firm their grip over the region by taking four more strategically important towns, effectively controlling at least 70 percent of the Anbar province. Complicating the response to the tensions is Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who came out to strongly oppose the U.S. Quote, intervention in Iraq. Now he said the insurgency was led by extremists and remnants of Saddam Hussein's regime and rejected the notion that it was sectarian war between Shiite and Sunnis. The impact of the leader's statement on a possible Tehran Washington alliance to defend Baghdad remains to be seen. Well, the OECD sees positive things ahead in the coming months for the Korean economy. The organization put Korea's composite leading indicator of economic activity, or CLI, at 101.01 in April. Now, this marks the 15th straight month that the index topped the benchmark 100. The CLI provides an economic outlook for six months from now based on economic data such as industrial activity, GDP, and capital flows. And a reading above 100 indicates economic expansion. The OECD average for April was 100.6. Now, Korea's figure was 101.01, um, and it is placed in 12th among OECD member nations. Well, women have been taking out on bigger roles here in Korea in recent years, but new data suggests that there's still a long road ahead towards gender equality. Well, according to a local information provider, Alio, only one out of every 10 executives working in the public sector is female. And that figure could actually be lower considering that some of the female executives have assumed more than one role at their respective agencies. Now, uh, by ministries, the agencies under the cultural ministry have the most female board members at 20 percent.
When the latest news meets the latest business stories, we give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Business Today with Moon Gon Yong, every weekday, only on Arirang. Samsung Electronics remains active in applying for patents across the world. Thomson Reuters, in its State of Innovation report, said Samsung had the most patent requests last year in, in both the mobile phone and semiconductor categories. Samsung also asked for the most patents in smart media contents. Now, as for other domestic companies, LG Electronics ranked number five in the kitchen appliances category, while Hyundai Motor was fourth for patents related to vehicles that run on alternative fuels. And on to another Korean company. The U.S. Food and Drug Association has given the green light to a Korean-made drug for the first time in 11 years. Civextro, an antibiotic made to treat infections on the superbacteria known as MRSA, was developed by Korean pharmaceutical company Tunga ST. Now, it marks the second locally developed drug to get the seal of approval from the U.S. agency. Tunga ST expects to pull in annual sales of about 293 million U.S. dollars from licensing royalties alone and then technology support from the U.S. producer and distributor of its drug. To open or not to open, that is the question. Well, we're talking about Korea's ever-sensitive rice market. The government here is leaning heavily toward a liberalization of its rice market, nudged by a move out of the Philippines. Let's take an in-depth look into the issue. Dr. Kim Byung-ju joins me live in the studio. Now, Dr. Kim, the uh, WTO last week gave Manila a five-year extension on a waiver to open up its rice market. Right. But local officials here are saying that it came at a steep cost. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, with mandatory imports more than doubling. Right. And in order for Korea to avoid that, mm -hmm. uh, it would have to uh, open up, I suppose, the rice market, mm -hmm. which is very sensitive, right? right, right. And uh, the Korean government faces a deadline. Right, indeed. Uh, deadline is, uh, depending on how you see it, Probably at the end of uh, June would be the time uh, in terms of like setting on its plan and then notifying the WTO by September. That's the deadline that the Korean government is facing at this point. Uh, we have two choices. Korea has two choices. One is the, the choice that Korea has kept in place since 1995 that is offering MMA, minimal market access, which is a Philippine style of dealing with the rice market, meaning that uh, by refusing to open the market, accept the responsibility to uh, have an import imported of uh, uh, this rice imported specific amount growing amount every year into this market that the that option government officials are saying is no longer viable and perhaps we should go with the Japan's way Japan back in 19 I think 1999 they chose tariffication tariffication is basically what the opponents of this idea are calling market opening of the rice but what happens is uh, a country has a right to set its uh, uh, not exactly right, but they can have an option to be negotiated with WTO members to start with a very high tariff and then reduce it gradually over time. So there are two options, MMA or tariffication, and it looks like the government has set up its mind in terms of going with the tariffication option for now because Korea just can't handle this MMA option of obligation of having to in, uh, import this increasing amount of rice market, which is already very much saturated. Right. Um, the rice market here is very sensitive for the, the country, and mm -hmm. consequently, I would imagine that uh, this opening up or the attempt to open up the rice market would be met by opposition. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that, that, has been, that mindset has been here in place uh, ever since 1995. Uh, you know, back in 1995, when Korea joined WTO, there was a huge 
controversy about whether to open the rice market or not uh, and all that and that has been always in place and opposition has been always been a strong one here and they are continuing to an, an, uh, making an argument here that if the government has set up its mind to go with the ter terrification that's a market opening rice market opening is not an option for Korean people uh, Korean rice is a sacred thing in their own uh, you know implication mm -hmm. and we cannot do it and the government should try once again to negotiate for extension of the MMA uh, minimum market access uh, which government says is no longer viable considering the rock, uh, rice market situation here but they're saying well Korean government should uh, negotiate once again that's what opponents are saying well let's take a look at the uh, supply and demand side of rice uh, these days right. what is the trend that we're seeing today in terms of rice consumption mm -hmm. and the amount of required imports basically Korean people are not consuming enough rice these mm -hmm. days while there is increasing amount of uh, import that's coming in uh, as an obligation under the MMA uh, you know principle or arrangement minimum market access let's bring up those uh, pictures uh, graphics that we have prepared here on the screen to explain that point right there on the left hand side uh, the rice import is increasing because this is our duty on the, the arrangement with the WTO members here we have to in continuously increase our import here while the rice consumption itself decreasing right now as, as of this year uh, 2014 the uh, self uh, uh, reliance or if you will uh, the the meaning that how much Korea, uh, how much of rice Korea produces that we consume here, it's called 92 percent. So, 92 uh, percent of the rice that we consume here are produced here domestically, right. and, and and then as an obligation with WTO members, we have to uh, import another about 99 percent of it. Sorry, 9 percent. Mm -hmm. So 92 percent being produced here, and then 9 percent being imported here. That already adds up over 100. Right, 101. It goes o over 100%. Mm -hmm. and so now currently Korean government is keeping about 500,000 tons of rice uh, in its storage place. And then uh, Dong according to Dong Ailbo, that's like a size of, according, at least according to this newspaper, it's a size of 10 football fields. Wow. And if we go with the current option of MMA, as the opponents are arguing, we have to build more of the rice storages where the rice will have to perish. This is food. They perish. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a huge waste. That's the government's argument. We cannot afford to go with, continue to go with the MMA option. And government is arguing that we have to go with terrification as a new option. Right. And, and, and you know, in general, the Koreans are, that their change of diet is playing a role because, you know, it used to be that the basic staple food here was rice right. and kimchi. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these days people, they have alternatives. Pasta, bread. Right. So, <laughs> you know, we don't consume as much rice. Exactly. So that's a problem. Right. Now, give us an outlook of what we should be expecting from here on. As I said, uh, by the end of this month, which is about like one week within this time <laughs> period, I suppose 10 days, government will have to uh, announce its position in terms of what it will do. And along with that, government will actually issue its statement to persuade the public about the necessity of this taking, uh, op, you know, taking the option of tariffication. That's coming up in within 10 days period of time here. And then after that, government will take that uh, bill or the idea or statement to the National Assembly and they like to get the National uh, Assembly's approval and with that the government Korean government will report to the WTO about the option that it wants to choose and after that starting from next year January 1st we will go with perhaps most likely uh, despite perhaps the opposition from the rice farmers probably will go with the tariffication uh, option that's the overall timetable or time schedule that we are looking ahead at this point. Well, you know, the quality of rice, quality of beef, mm -hmm. a very, uh, very, very sensitive, you know, things for the Korean people right. and their diet. So mm -hmm. it's something that, um, that, that's been left very sensitive and right. perhaps it's now time to tackle that. Exactly. Very important issue for all of us here. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, another thrilling day of World Cup action has passed us by with day 11 in Brazil bringing in 
two late goals and a surprise big victory. But it surely wasn't a hopeful day for Team Korea as、um, its chances of advancing to the next round, the round of 16, dimmed with the Tiger Warriors losing 4-2 to Algeria in their second tournament in Group H. Our sports correspondent Song Ji-san joins us for her take on Korea's probability of advancing to the next round and the weaknesses that the Korean squad revealed in this defeat.、Uh, Ji-san, it was rather a shocking performance on the part of the Korean squad, one that、um, really cannot be defended by any terms, especially because their performance in the first match against Russia was so much better. I couldn't agree with you more, Kanyang, on that. It was even painful to watch Korea giving away goal after another in such a poor first half performance. The Algerians' goals, on the other hand, were impeccably taken, but Korea didn't make it that hard for them with empty spots all over the place. Now Korea lost two goals in a space of just two minutes after Algeria's Islam Slimani scored the first on 26th minute. And in the first half, three nil down, and without a single shot at goal, Korea looked down and out. But there was a few minutes of hope when Son Heung-min pulled a goal back in the 50th minute. But unfortunately, the win was knocked out of Korea's sails 12 minutes after when Algeria made it 4-1. Korea's Kudetter got a consolation goal in 72nd minutes, but that's how it would end: 4-2 to Algeria. The Algerian team brought up five fresh faces from their first game, making it even harder for the Korean squad to know what to expect. Well, I suppose、um, you know, in everyone's mind now is,、uh, do we still have a chance of making it through to the knockout stage? Well, again, we do have a chance, but that's very, very, very slim. The only way Korea can ever finish the top two in this group is they have to beat Belgium in a massive victory, and Algeria must fail to beat Russia. But even in this case, Korea needs a bucketful of goals, as we have lost the most goals in the group. We essentially need to beat Belgium, which is a very strong European side, and then hope Russia to do us favor against Algeria. But Belgium is the top seed in Group H, with the highest FIFA ranking of 11th, and they do have already qualified for the knockout stage. Now, one hopeful note is that Belgium's coach says he will not put his first 11 out against Korea, as he wants to give a chance to other players who have not yet played in the World Cup. Well, regardless, definitely hoping that、uh, the match is not the last one for the Korean footballers at this year's World Cup. Thank you, Jisun, for that. Sure. Well, once again, tens of thousands of Koreans gave up their sleep to come out to the streets across the country early this morning to catch their Tega Warriors take on Algeria. Although jubilation quickly turned into grief, despair, and then horror as the Algerians netted one goal after another, they remain hopeful that the squad can advance to the next round. Our Connie Kim was out on the streets of Seoul to catch the Red Devils in action. Disappointment was written across the faces of the tens of thousands of fans who braved the heavy rain to cheer on Korea in their second World Cup group game against Algeria. Nearly 40,000 people gathered in front of Coex Convention Center, one of the biggest cheering spots in downtown Seoul, to support the Red Devils. Live music performances meant the atmosphere was festive before the match. The happy mood and optimism soon turned to disappointment, however, as Algeria stuck three goals past Korea in the first half. Although Team Korea's first victory didn't come in the match against Algeria on this Monday morning, hopes are high that their win will come in their match against Belgium on Friday morning. Today's game was a turning point to make it further in the tournament. I thank Son Heung-min and Koo Jae-chul for scoring a goal each. Although we lost today, I support our team and believe we can do well in our next match. If we play like we did during the second half of this game. I think we have a good chance of beating Belgium on Friday. The fans said the team's poor defending in the first half cost them in the end. Our attacking play was pretty good, but we were vulnerable to counterattacks. You never know what can happen in football. I believe we can win against Belgium and qualify for the last 16. On the day of the big match against Belgium on Friday, the cheers will be heard all the way to Brazil. Fans across the country refuse to give up hope that Korea can go at least one stage further in the World Cup. Connie Kim, Arirang News.
And that's your business today on this Monday. Thank you for watching and do join us again at 6 p.m. Korea time on Early Edition at 6.